Debbie Kruger, welcome to Australian Musician. Oh, Greg Phillips, what a joy to see you, literally. Uh, uh, we're speaking to you because your book, Songwriters Speak, uh, Conversations About Creating Music, which you uh, first released in 2005, has just been re-released, uh, a conversation with 45 songwriters, um, some who aren't with us anymore. Um, when it was first released in 2005, um, had, was it an idea you'd been thinking about for a long time? What was the, the goal initially? Yeah, I had um, been starting to spend a lot of time in LA and I picked up in about 97 the great Paul Zollo book, the first volume of what ended up being like three different editions or volumes of Songwriters on Songwriting. And, you know, it wasn't the first time a, a, an interviewer writer had done a Q&A book. There's actors on you know there's actors on acting and directors on directing and but to get songwriters to talk about how they were writing and inspirations I thought was quite interesting for me so I devoured that book from start to finish and started thinking wouldn't it be great if there were an Australian New Zealand version and then I went and worked for APRA as their head of communications for a few years and Put together that if anyone remembers uh 10 best songs for the APRA 75th anniversary when Friday on my mind was number one and and um got to know you know some very elite songwriters of Australia and also was doing interviews for the APRA members journal APRA and I interviewed Paul Kelly and Andrew Farris and I remember, and Graham Goble, they were like the three first cover stories I had. And I spoke to each of them about this idea and they were all like, well, not so much Paul because he's so self-effacing, but Andrew and Graham were like, I would want to be a part of that. We need a book like that here. I would support you. And so while I was working at APRA, I was also developing this, this idea and this proposal and came over to LA before I had the book deal and managed to sit down with John Farrah and Steve Kipner. And so I had enough chapters to put into a proposal and go and get the book deal. And then it coincided with me leaving APRA. So I focused pretty much full time on putting the book together um, from 2003 to 2005. Um, and, there, and here it is. And, the, and you know, 2005 and 2000. Where are we? 23. <laughs> Slight difference, but but not too recognisable, as in the look, the cover. Yeah. Uh, and it's just the forward that is different? I wrote a new forward um, to explain why it was back and to address the elephant in the room of Rolf Harris and why I had decided to retain the chapter. Um, and all the reasons I decided to retain the chapter aren't in that forward, but I just felt without even naming him by name, that it was important to acknowledge that there might be people that would question that decision because the chapter is chapter two. And so if you're flicking through that book, you're, you're unlikely to miss it. Um, interestingly, the week that I was about to announce the book release, Rolf's death was announced. And the hour I announced the book, Joy McKean, chapter one, her death was announced. And so where my press release said, um, since this book came out, six of the songwriters have since passed away. Well, now we're eight. Yeah. And, um, and but that just speaks to why, one of many reasons why I wanted this book to be out there and available again, because yeah. these stories, you know, who else is going to get them yeah. after these people are gone? Um, many of the songwriters uh, are or were notoriously hard to track down for an interview, um, particularly uh, people like Vander and Young, um, Silver Chairs, Daniel Johns, Daniel Jones from uh, Savage Garden is quite media shy. Did some of the interviewees take a, a long time to track down? Well, the three you mentioned, interestingly, were not at all hard because Harry I'd been working with when I was at APRA because Friday on My Mind was the number one best Australian song and I did so much PR with him and work with him and and he just opened his um, Flashpoint studio in Surrey Hills in Sydney and 
um, he was very accessible. Getting getting George was, you know, more um, was was a little bit more long winded, but not difficult because once Harry had done it, it was quite obvious to their people that well, you've got to have George too then, um, and that was done long distance. Um, Daniel Johns had good management that recognised that it was worth doing. So it, it wasn't a problem. He was an interesting time in his life. You know, he was working with, um, oh, what that disassociatives project. Um, and uh, saw the chair were on hiatus, if not over already. And he was married to Natalie and Brulier. And, and he was sort of a bit airy-fairy. And it was an interesting time. And as for Daniel, um, no, again, I had worked with him um, doing PR stuff at APRA because Savage Garden kept winning awards at the APRA Music Awards and um, Daniel would always turn up to those awards. So that was just the case of, of calling him and saying, I'm coming up to Brizzy to interview you. Are we good? And he's like, oh, okay. And the fact that, you know, I interviewed Darren in London separately uh, they both understood that I wanted to tell the story of Savage Garden songwriting, regardless of whether they were still together or communicating very much. And I think that's what made that chapter actually even more poignant. Yeah. yeah. Were, were there any songwriters that you were chasing that you didn't get? Yes. Well, yes. And and just, yes. Okay, so to answer that, and then I want to go back to some of the songwriters that were a little bit more difficult to pin down. I want a Barry Gibb. I still want Barry Gibb. Barry, I want you. I want you. I want to. I want to sit at your feet and worship you and ask you every question imaginable about every song you ever wrote. And then I want to ask you more, please. At the time I was doing the book, um, Maurice Gibb had died, just died, and so Barry's personal manager just was protecting him. Um, and I really wanted Angus and Malcolm Young. And not because I'm an ACDC fan, uh, just because they are, I think, to this day, still Australia's most successful, commercially successful songwriting exports. And I think the, the comparison of doing Bander and Young and then further down in the book doing Angus and Malcolm would have been a nice, a nice uh, thread. Um, I was disappointed there. People just didn't want that to happen. And then people would tell me, other musicians, songwriters that were really good friends with Malcolm in particular would say, oh, Malcolm would have loved to do this because he never felt that he's been taken seriously as a songwriter. And if he knew everyone else that we, you were interviewing in the book, he, he would love to do it. But that was a case where the ACDC machine was too strong for me. Nick Cave's assistant did everything in her power to dissuade me. And I just kept saying to her, do you understand that if I do not put Nick Cave in this book, no one will ever take me or the book seriously. In fact, I will be tarred and feathered in the streets of Melbourne. You have to get me to Nick. And she didn't get it really. You know, she was based in London. Um, but she finally, after months of hassling and saying, I am coming to London. These are the dates. I need to see Nick. Um, she finally said, you can go down to his place in Hove and you'll have one hour. And so I drove down and I wasn't a Nick Cave fan. I just studied him for the interview. And it, it's really poignant when I think back on it because he met me at the front door of his house and there was his wife, Susie, and the twins and uh, little boys at the time. And then Nick said, come on, we'll go to my office, which was this messy flat around the corner that he was renting to, to write. And we sat down and he sat at his desk and I sat on the other side and he said, is this like that Paul Volobel, Songwriters on Songwriting? And he pointed to it on his bookshelf. And I went, exactly. That's exactly what this. And he said, I always wanted to do this. That's exactly what I thought it was. So the assistant kept ringing on the hour and he would say, darling, leave us alone. And I got more than three hours with him. And that was a good one. Um, there, were, there were a few that took their time to say, to make themselves available. And then there were a couple that wouldn't sign off on their interviews for a long time but one in particular who I didn't expect to be so difficult but he just sat on his interview for eight months and uh, just wouldn't even make the time to read it in order to sign the release form whereas songwriters like Nick Cave or Rob and Jim from Midnight Oil or Mark Seam or people I thought might be a bit tough 
and want to take their time. They just trusted me. They trusted what I'd done and they went, yeah, no worries. Good luck with it. Yeah. So it was a lot of different experiences. Um, and I remember those, ex I remember those moments and those experiences really, really well, because for me, the joy was sitting down with Rob Hurst and Jim and Ginny for three hours. And then as we were all saying goodbye, Rob turning around and looking at me and saying, you ask good questions. <laughs> Yeah. you know yeah. that's that's what i remember yeah. about that day readers will know most of these songwriters and the, the songs they're talking about uh what they won't know until they read the book are the little nuggets of gold that uh pop up um things like uh paul simon's connection to the seekers or billy thorpe writing with albert king um Steve Kipner writing songs for Chicago or Christina Agu Aguilera. Aguilera. Aguilera, there you go. Well, um, he wrote he wrote Jenny in a Bottle, which was her breakthrough hit. Yeah. Um, and yes, he wrote Hard Habit to Break, and there's a great story he tells about how they were in the studio recording it and they needed another verse. And he was with his wife Lizzie in a cabin in the snow up in Big Bear, and they were in a phone booth delivering lines for another verse and his wife contributed a line and um and that's interesting because I was always a Chicago fan and I you know 1984 when that song came out I think on the 17th album I I didn't know that story and I didn't know Steve and it was just a a credit on the song so it's yeah those kinds of of gems or yeah Bruce Woodley talking about writing with a very difficult Paul Simon on Red Rubber Ball, which is a great little pop song, isn't it? Yeah. It's a great song. Yeah. 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 yeah, I loved all of that. People like Billy Thorpe and Brian Cadd um, had great tales of their times, you know, in LA or, you know, in Nashville or, or working with some... Um, with iconic legendary session players and other songwriters. Um, James Rain told me a story about coming to LA and, and being put in a songwriting session, you know, a co-writing session with Holly Knight, um, who had written with Mike Chapman and, and written great songs for Tina Turner and Pat Benatar. And James wasn't vibing it, you know, it wasn't his way of doing things. And all those years later, I come to LA to live. And a few years ago, I spent three months working with Holly Knight on PR for her when the Tina musical was um, was launching on Broadway. And um, I would, you know, I didn't know much about Holly when I was interviewing James. So there's so many great little tidbits and stories that resonate all the way to today for me. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's a large book at over 600 pages. Uh, how did you know when you had enough and, and to start oh, facing interviews? I didn't have enough. My my wish list was like 100 songwriters. And um, at one point, one publisher was very interested, but they wanted me to do the interviews narrative style where I would tell the stories and only have 12 interviews. And that was a, a significant publisher. And I turned my back on that. I said, no, that's not the format. So I was very lucky to find Limelight Press, the original publisher of the book. But we, um, they were very open. But when they saw the length of the interviews, that, I don't remember whether they said, you know, we can only have 600 pages or you can only have 40 chapters. But it just, we figured out that that was going to work. It's a lot of chapters for a book of this kind, the first and only of its kind in our region, in Australia, New Zealand. Um, and there were many, you know, well, there were plenty left out that, oh, there was one other I wanted. And I can tell this story. <laughs> um, I really wanted Greg McCange, obviously, the, the Skyhook songs. He was really one of the first, if not the first prominent, songwriter of a pop rock band to name local name places you know sunsets over Carlton and, and and that sort of thing and you know notoriously sardonic and and I just I wanted that conversation and he wanted to be paid to do the interview all right so I went no nah. <laughs> um 
which was a shame because it just would have been amazing to have him in it. And um, and I should have, and I didn't. I just didn't. He wasn't on my final list, but I should have included Dave Faulkner. Um, there are a lot of interesting things about Dave, not just the Huda Guru songs, which are, um, they were here in LA a few weeks ago, actually, I caught up with them, um, which are just great, you know, uh, parts of Australia's musical landscape and, you know, the same era as the Mentals and, and Midnight Oil and that whole pub rock scene. Um, but I think Dave is an interesting character and I, I had, I interviewed him years later for the National Film and Sound Archives Oral History Program and I kept thinking, I wish he'd been in the book. And there were a few others. I wouldn't have minded Keith Urban and I made initial approaches and it was much earlier in his career. I mean, he was big already here, but not as big as he is now. Um, but no, I, I was really pleased with the final output and there will always be more and there'll always be people who will criticise me for not including Foster and McClellan or whatever. And, oh, well, I would have liked more women, but at the time, given the historical perspective of the book, there weren't really a lot more women that I could have included. Now there'd be a lot more. But Missy Higgins was very new on the scene in 2004. And um, Casey was the youngest female that I, Casey Chambers was the youngest I had, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad I got Chrissy Amplett, who said to me at the end of the interview, she thanked me. She said, no one ever took me seriously as a songwriter. I was perceived to be this chick on stage wearing a school uniform and peeing on stage, you know, and, and that I'm a songwriter. That's how I see myself. So that was gratifying to me. Yeah. When the book originally came out, it was accompanied by a, a CD. Did you attempt to get a, a re-release of that or in some nobody, book? Nobody buys CDs. And to be honest, no, I didn't. Um, I didn't think about, you know, it was a festival mushroom release. They don't exist anymore in that format. I guess I would have had to go to Dean McLaughlin at Liberation to see if he would be interested in dragging it out and putting it up on digital, on iTunes and or Apple Music, as it is now called. Um, no, it's a, it's a treasure I've got in my in my storage unit in Sydney because I'm in LA as I speak to you. I've got like eighty or a hundred of them still there. So next time I'm in Australia, if anybody wants the CD, double CD with great liner notes. Um, let me know. It's interesting because it's it's essentially Australian and New Zealand songwriters and the song, you know, examples of the songs they wrote, but there's two international songs in there because there's Devil Woman by Cliff Richard representing Terry Britton and there's Hard Habit to Break. Because I didn't want to put Let's Get Physical on there because John Farrow was, was Olivia Newton-John was, you know, on there for John Farrow. Um, so who are your favourite songwriters? My favourite songwriters or who were the favourite songwriters in the book? Uh, from the book. The ones I enjoyed interviewing the most were Nick Cave because it was surprising how, how great he was and how well I got on with him. My favourite of all was Tim Finn because he just spoke so beautifully. Everything he said was like poetry. I just loved the way his mind thought. Um, John Farrah because he hadn't done a lot of interviews prior to me. In fact, I don't think he'd ever done a lengthy interview before I turned up on his doorstep and you know, I would say to him, John, you wrote, you're the one that I want, period. That's it. You you can retire on that, babe, you know, and he'd be like, oh, no, oh, I'm still trying to make my, write my great work. Um, and John Walker, because he did his, he was, he was very into it. He was a great participant, but he would do his best to give me a short, sharp answer and I would probe him. You know, I would keep asking and and he liked and respected that. And I got the opportunity to interview him one or two more times in the years after. And he was always very responsive to me because he respected the way I interview. And, and that was the joy of it. I mean, there are lots that I love doing, but they're the four that have always stood out. Um, my favourite songwriters ever. My favourite Australian song is e still Evie parts one, two and three. Vander and Young. Um, you mentioned a lot of songwriters that you wished you'd interviewed. Uh, have you thought about a sequel? 
No, I'm too old and tired. It's it's like giving birth. And and the truth is I'm not the right person with my taste in music and my very historical perspective. You know, you know me. I'm a I'm a legacy artist gal, I'm a classic rock gal. Um it's not for me to go and talk to Tones and I or any of those, you know, it, it, it's for someone else to do. I would, I would do an expanded edition if I could get Barry and Rick Springfield and Keith Urban and, um, and Angus Young and, um, and then maybe include Missy and a few other females that had come that had, that had really risen to great heights in those years after. But no, I'm moving on to other books. I've got a few on the on the back burner, one I want to bring back to the front burner. So, um, which I think you know, I've been working for a few years on a book about sherbet. So, um, so yeah, other, other fish to fry. I just really wanted this book out there again. I, too many people had been contacting me about how they could get it. And now anyone can get it anywhere in the world. Yeah, uh, via the website? They can go to songwritersspeak.com and hit the buy button and go to a page with a bunch of links. But essentially, Amazon, Booktopia, um, and ebook uh, sellers as well, um, including Apple Books, you can buy the ebook version of as well. So there's no Audible, obviously, because I'd need the original songwriters to read out their responses and it wouldn't sound right. Um, but I'm really, really happy that anyone in the world can order this book because it's print to order, which is the way a lot of books are being published these days. Yeah. Well, I'm I'm glad that the book is uh, out and re-release again too. Uh, Debbie Kruger, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Greg. So good to see you alive and kicking. Thank you.